enough, and maybe yes. you can shout them out. Yes. Where are you all at? Yes. 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 Thank you so much for the gift of that word. This is incredible. How did you find your way to this story, Dana? So um, it was inspired by an actual day in my life. So the it started out as a pilot script. So um, I was working at a bar, um, saving up money for the last of my transition-related stuff that I wanted to do. Um, and I come from a very, I'll say financially unstable home. Um, and basically um, there was a major, without getting into too many details, there was a major financial issue in my family and the money that I had been saving was taken um, to solve that issue. And so someone came into the bar that day that I was working at and I've always had a really good memory for numbers and her credit card wouldn't swipe so I did manual entry and I just had the fleeting thought of like, I could just steal her credit card number and pay my <laughs> surgery deposit. <laughs> Which I didn't. <laughs> Officially. <laughs> but <laughs> the thought after that was who's that character? And so she kind of became this like alter ego in my mind. And you know, I wrote a pilot and um, the, uh, it was on the GLAD list this year, and it was also finalist for the Sundance Episodic Program. Um, and, um, you know, I just, this story is in me, and I, I just wanted to make something with it. And I, you know, took the 63-page pilot, and Zen was super instrumental in helping me get it down to 11 pages. And then uh, we shot it. Yeah. Zen, this is slick as hell. What, how did you pull this off? <laughs> it was tricky. Um, yeah, I mean, we, this, this took almost three, three years because, of course, COVID happened and then we, you know, we planned to shoot it and then that didn't happen and then COVID and then, then finally we shot it. Um, it took a lot of prep. Um, this was, it's my first narrative short and I really, love this story deeply because I love Shira deeply. Uh, I, I've always been fascinated and feel more, I feel closer to anti-hero characters than I do any other characters. Like, I really could give a shit about Superman or any of those people. Like, I'm more interested in morally flawed people because that is what is real. Uh, not anyone that lives on this binary of like, this is what truth is. Like, no, fuck it. Can I curse? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's like, um, um, so, yeah, a lot of, uh, just absolutely a lot of shot listing, and we had an incredible, incredible producing team. We had an incredible, incredible team of people that um, helped make it. And anti-heroism is something that everybody is, uh, should, could, should be able to claim. It's incredible, I mean, when you get one millimeter into trans history, and we are just <laughs> a community that has survived um, in some proximity to petty crime, organized crime. Uh, you know, the girls are grifters. And, I mean, not just the girls, trans folks in general have always existed on the margins and found ingenious ways uh, to survive, to navigate the world in which, you know, they cannot uh, have official papers. I mean, it's just, one example after another throughout history, I think about um, the many legends who, my grandmother Flawless Sabrina, for example, <laughs> coming up in 1950s, in the 60s as an out queer person, she was a legitimate grifter, <laughs> which a lot of people don't know, but she was counterfeiting paintings, she learned how to do all of this stuff. As, a way to support herself in a world that would, would never have her. So how did you um, come to your anti-heroism, Dana? It's a good question. Um, you know, I, it's funny, there was, there was actually a line that got cut um, from the film that um, is sort of relevant to the answer, which is that um, at one point, Shira talks about like being from a Jewish family, and she says, 
Um, it's funny, there's that stereotype about Jews and money. In actuality, it's hard to gain generational wealth when you're being genocided once a century. <laughs> and that's, like, that's my family. It's like my, my great uncle, who was a Holocaust survivor, hid money in the mattress and like, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And because of that inherited trauma, you know, around like money and you need to flee at a moment's notice and all of that, it's like, my family, they never did anything illegal or anything like that, but they were always like, you know, like paying a check on a Sunday so they knew it wouldn't come out of the account and then purposely over, overdrawing the account. You know, like shit like that, like little things to like get by, um, especially in moments where there was a lot of financial instability. And so I, I always kind of grew up in that sort of like mindset, which I do think is like borderline grifting, you know? And then there's the reality that, like you were saying, like the girls get their needs met however they are gonna get them met, you know? And there is a reality to that. Um, also, like Zen, I've always found um, anti-heroes interesting and, and also for me more, the reason why I've, I thought it was so important to create this character and to write this story is because I'm a big believer in these like didactic, educational kind of trans narratives, which I think there was a place for at a time. They actually have a tendency to other us even further because they sort of turn us into this like object to learn about, right? Rather than like an actual fully realized human being. And I think that the anti-hero space allows us to present trans people in full humanity, full dimension, and that I think is actually more relatable to cis people than like trying to educate them in, in more overt ways. So I also was very interested in it from that perspective as well. Absolutely, it's the cracks and the flaws, and th those are the things that create access or open us up, and it's also where our intuition comes from, apparently. Then, what are your thoughts on anti-heroism? Uh, my thoughts are, I remember when I was a kid and everyone wanted to play Power Rangers outside and then they looked at me and they were like, but you're the witch. And I was like, fabulous. Um, uh, because uh, the, the anti-heroes or the quote unquote villains sometimes, they're the ones that are actually absolutely the most interesting. Like I could give, uh, I'm not gonna curse anymore. I, I don't care about so many of the Disney shows, but I care about Maleficent. I care about like Ursula. I care about what th those stories are. And I think, um, you know, there's something to be said that why, why we're attracted to that is because I think it's, re it's more relatable that like life isn't perfect and I need to find a way to fucking survive and do it with a little bit of flair. Um, which I, I, think, I think that's also like what I, I tried to do in this film is the beginning montage that we have. I want Shira to feel absolutely sexy, incredible, um, because we, we need to see more of these types of characters on the screen um, so that we can get, we can get the, you know, it's, it, there's the Walter White who is a great, great show, Breaking Bad, but we have so many of these anti-heroes that are out there and they're white cisgender men um, and they're getting five seasons, but we don't have any of that within the, the trans community. And like, that's, we need to see this. Uh, you, basically, people should just give you money right now, Dana, so that we can make this. <laughs> and thank you for um, being my Jewish witchy sister. Um, I love them. <laughs> planting that in there. I mean, in this film, we have a multi-dimensional trans woman who gets to speak French and uh, right. interceptive, <laughs> beautiful ring. <laughs> there's so many um, textures and layers to this character that we receive so succinctly. What is your hope um, for this time in trans representation and for the future? I mean, I really hope that um, I hope that we see more and more work that is actually made by trans artists because I think that, like, I've seen, you know, I've seen so many trans films made by cisgender people that they just, the lived experience isn't in the character, you know what I mean? Where it's like, it feels like a cis person's imagination of what a trans experience is. 
And not that there's a singular trans experience, but the more trans people there are um, whose stories are being told, the more, and told authentically, the more sort of taste people will get for what authentic trans experiences are. And the thing that I think the most important message is those stories are out there. Like, I know so many incredible trans writers, directors, uh, filmmakers who are doing incredible, incredible work. And the, the support needs to be there. It's like Hollywood needs to kind of wake up and start realizing that like that's where the good stuff is, is to support people of particular communities to tell the stories of those communities. And Zen, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the journey of the film and how you know you created a community of support around it. I understand it was I supported the you crowdfunding, did. right? Yeah. Yeah. Crowdfunding. You also gave notes on an early draft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the support around the film, I mean, how well, I, do it. how do you get to this level of, um, um, well, one, it was, uh, I would say, uh, props to Dana, who became as the big producer on this project, uh, and like had a email list like I've never seen to make sure that this project got funded, so props to you, love. Um, and I, that, that was obviously a big part of it, um, which was honestly really inspiring to see someone who wants their art out there and is gonna do anything to put it out there. Um, yeah, I love you. Um, I, I think outside of that, it became about finding the right people and um, big props to our DP, Oren, who is a queer DP. Um, like every everything from the types of lenses that we put on this film, which were Hawk on Anamorphics, we did that because one, it's yes, it's stunning and it serves the story, but two, also like we don't get to see f our our stories shot in this type of way often. Um, anamorphics are usually preserved for uh, more the, the big budget types of movies. So and they they were never really given to to the, any any queer, queer people, and, and that's why like making even those types of decisions um, can be revolutionary. Um, and then we also had an amazing, amazing team. Uh, most of our crew, basically the whole uh, whole prog was queer. Uh, it was, uh, it was. There was a lot of tears at the end of the set um, because it should, like, it should feel like family. It should feel safe. People came up to me telling me how safe they felt on this set. And while I love that, I also think that just it has to be. That has to be the norm, because it's not the norm, and that's it, which is baffling to me. Um, we're working, you know, many, many, many hours, and we have to stand up for each other in those parts. And every single person was okay with wearing another hat. You know, I I, I know it's like in in this industry, it, there's this idea that like, well, I just do this role, and that's my role, and that's it. No one touches what I do, and I can respect that. But I, I, I think that that's a very narrow way of doing it. Like, I think we have to allow space to um, give our other uh, other sides of artistry and, and bring bring people up. You know, for for example, Oren, the DP, was was helping uh, the, the um, other people on set with different things, like set design, for example. Like, that's not that's not his job, but he's commenting on that and he wants to change those things, and that doesn't normally happen on a lot of other sets. So that type of support, creating that family vibe um, is, is, is really crucial, and, safe, and, that's, and that's safe vibe. Thank you both so much for your art, for your story. Thank you all for convening and for being here. What a gift, we're gonna keep it moving. Um, so that's one